on 15th Avenue South. Tucked away in a quiet suburban Richfield neighborhood sits a little greenhouse. From the outside, it looks much like its neighbors. Ordinary, unremarkable, but in this case, deceiving. It was a hellhole. A hellhole. A hellhole, yeah. 20-year-old Andrew Davies grew up inside the home, a place neighbors drove by, but few outsiders were ever allowed in. No kid should have to suffer through that at all. Andrew was the oldest of eight special needs children, all fostered and adopted by Betsy Davies and her adult daughter, Erin, a blended family that on the surface seemed like the Brady Bunch. And none of them ever said a word. Even close family friend Jessica Ballantyne says she had no idea that behind the closed door and Christmas wreath for the Davies children, life was not so pretty. I feel very foolish that I, I didn't discover it sooner. The happy family image was shattered in mid-January. Betsy Davies had died a few weeks earlier. Court and child protection records show Aaron for at least the past six months was regularly drinking until numb. On the night of January 9th, records show she was intoxicated, passed out, and the kids could not wake her. Andrew, feeling lost and afraid, knowing he couldn't care for all the kids on his own. I just couldn't do anymore. Called a family friend and said, help. And that's when I found and discovered the condition of the home. When Jessica arrived to pick up the kids, <sighs> this is what she found. I was horrified. Garbage piled everywhere, floors rotting through, ceilings caving in. If you look up here, there's black mold all over, and it looks like the floor from above is about to fall through. We saw it firsthand a few days later, after a group of friends had already spent hours hauling trash in soiled mattresses outside. What bare floor there was, was still Stuck. filthy. Stuck to the floor. Bedrooms filled chest high with bags of old clothes. The door to the main bathroom sitting in the middle of the tub that obviously wasn't being used. I feel horrible that they never said anything, that they were living this way. Living in a home that most can't stand. Oh my gosh, that's disgusting. To be in for long. Oh my gosh. I'd never seen anything like that in my life. Everything clothes and, and soiled pull-ups and cat feces, syringes, pill bottles everywhere. It was not a safe environment for children to be living in. Jessica's discovery set in motion a string of events. Child maltreatment reports, juvenile court proceedings, child protection taking the kids, Aaron Davies entering alcohol detox, and a city inspector viewing the home in February, slapping a padlock on the door what Andrew called a hellhole, the city ruled unsafe for human occupancy. It raises the question, just how long has it been this way? Our investigation uncovered evidence that shows the kids could have and probably should have been helped much, much sooner. What we discovered is an apparent complete breakdown in the system by state and county workers whose very job it is to ensure the vulnerable children taken into this home by the Davies were healthy and safe. This system, in my opinion, has damaged these kids as much as the people they lived with. This woman, who asked we not show her face, says she used to be close with the Davies family. It's just so sad. And the conditions inside the house. And that was years ago. Had been that way for years. I had found one of the cats that had been missing for a while. She describes scraping that long dead cat off the floor of a child's bedroom. And I had to scrape it up off of the floor and that was the most horrific thing I've ever done. Looking over photos taken inside the home. Best way to describe is disgusting. Andrew says the family had been living that way nearly as long as he can remember. He lived in a bedroom at the back of the basement. How did you get back to your downstairs and back to your bedroom? Climb over stuff or I would clean like a pathway to my room. You actually had to climb over stuff just to get down to your bedroom? Yeah. And what's even more alarming, friends say Hennepin County Child Protection was warned about it years ago. You made reports to Child Protective Services? I have. I have in the past, yes. This is one of the issues that you brought up when you got a hold of CPS? It is. It is. And that was years ago? Years ago. And it's exactly the same. This letter shows that someone else made a report to Hennepin County Child Protection in 2010, alleging a child was maltreated. But CPS determined Child Protective Services 
are not needed. Child protection investigations are secret, so we don't know if they actually inspected the house, but nothing seemed to change. And after the second call, and it was still unsubstantiated, I just stopped making calls. I didn't feel like it was going to get anywhere anyway. And we discovered Hennepin County Child Protection is not the only government agency to drop the ball. Because the kids have special needs, they qualified for Minnesota's Personal Care Assistance Program, run by the Department of Human Services. That paid tens of thousands of dollars to the family. State law requires a qualified professional visit the home twice a year. Their job, to ensure the kids' health and safety needs are met. What's more, a Hennepin County public health nurse also is required to visit the home each year to do an assessment. This is a copy of the assessment done for Andrew Davies last July. A nurse wrote, he's living in a neat and clean home. <laughs> I wonder if they were at the neighbor's house. <laughs> I guess I don't understand how that could have been, that report could have been made that way. So just how did child protection the State Department of Human Services and a county health nurse keep missing something as obvious as the condition inside this home. Did they ever send anybody into the house to look at the house? Uh, yes, but we would stack. We would only go in the living room. Andrew says Betsy and Aaron would clean up the front living room just enough to be acceptable and close doors leading to the rest of the home. Nobody ever went past the living room? No. no. The nurses would come and they never saw your bedroom, they never saw the bathroom, they no. never, and they never saw the kitchen? No, never. Why not? I don't know, that's a good question. Yeah, this case raises lots of questions, not just about Hennepin County and the state's failure to protect these children, but also about what appears to be hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of fraud that taxpayers were funding. We're going to have that part of our investigation tomorrow night. What we've turned up is evidence that taxpayers have been footing the bill to keep children living in filthy and unsafe conditions while state and county workers turn a blind eye. 20 year old Andrew Davies is a young man with an eye set firmly on the road ahead. Yeah, the past is not a place he wants to dwell and I want to move on. But Andrew's past is now at the center of a state investigation into Medicaid fraud. We're going to be investigating this more. Launched when Carol Levin presented evidence to Jerry Kerber. Oh, wow. The inspector general for the Minnesota Department of Human Services. Well, this is interesting. Carol Levin's investigation has turned up evidence that taxpayers have been footing the bill while local and state officials missed warnings that Andrew and the other children were living in horrific conditions. No kid should have to suffer through that at all. To understand what Andrew suffered, you have to know about the home on 15th Avenue South in Richfield he grew up in. It's embarrassing as hell. Last night, we showed you the conditions where Andrew and his blended family of seven younger adopted children lived. Trash and dirty laundry filled rooms chest deep. The kids said they often slept on bare mattresses stained with animal feces and urine. Cat poop on the floor, uh, cat pee sometimes everywhere. But that's not all we found. Carol Levin also uncovered these records that show for years your tax dollars have been paying for the children's care. Care that does not appear to have been provided as claimed. Because all the kids had varying levels of special needs, they qualified for in-home personal care assistance, a Medicaid program run by Minnesota's Department of Human Services. But our investigation raises questions about how tens of thousands of tax dollars have been spent on care Andrew says wasn't truly needed or received. For example, Andrew's records show for years his personal care assistant or PCA was paid to help him with dressing, grooming, toileting, eating and bathing. This report from five years ago claimed he was incontinent, wears pull up diapers at all times and the PCA has to help in cleaning him up. That's not true. No, not at all. Just last year, a report said he was still incontinent. How long have you been going to the bathroom by yourself with no problems? <laughs> a long time. Uh, man, ever since I was five, probably. Another report claims Andrew's PCA worker had to set up the bathroom for bath and assist in cleanup of the bathroom after use. Just look at the bathrooms when we saw them. A floor rotted, a ceiling caving in. Here, that's all black and old. In fact, the door to the main bathroom was sitting in the middle of the tub that 
obviously wasn't being used. So is someone cashing in on Andrew and the other kids? Records show Betsy Davies adopted Andrew and five younger children. Her daughter, Erin Davies, adopted two other children. Turns out, Betsy was being paid as the PCA for Aaron's kids, and Aaron was being paid as the PCA for Betsy's. This while all of them lived together under one roof. In this timesheet from late December of last year, Betsy Davies claimed to work 38 hours providing PCA care to one of Aaron's adopted sons. The same week, Aaron claims to spend 21 hours working with one of Betsy's daughters and another 34 hours helping Andrew. No. Didn't happen? No. I mean, I could eat myself. I'm a, I can dress myself. Um, yeah, I did a lot on my own. How many hours a week would you say she was helping the kids, helping you? Once, probably every two weeks. Juvenile court records filed in January seem to back up Andrew's claim. They say Aaron regularly drank until numb, to the point of passing out, often leaving Andrew, the boy who supposedly couldn't even go to the bathroom by himself, in charge. Family friend Jessica Ballantyne discovered the truth about the house when Betsy Davies died in early January. With Aaron passed out drunk, Andrew called Jessica asking for help. Oh my God. What she found <sighs> turned uh -oh. her stomach. <sighs> That's also horrifying, right, to know as a taxpayer that I was paying for these children to be living this way. So was Erin Davies and her mom billing taxpayers for hours they didn't work? Wanting answers, we tried calling and emailing Erin Davies without any luck. Excuse me, Miss Davies. I'm Carol Levin. We want to ask you some questions about the PCA hours you claim you were working. So we tracked her down. Were you lying on those timesheets or were you actually working those hours? She didn't say a single word. But Jerry Kerber, the man at DHS, whose job it is to investigate PCA fraud, had plenty to say when we showed him the results of our investigation and played for him Andrew's allegations. Bathing, eating. No. Didn't happen? No. Looking at what we've just showed you, does this look to be like a serious problem? There certainly are some inconsistencies that need to be sorted out, and um, we will proceed in doing that. Our investigation discovered this is not an isolated case. Fraud runs rampant in the taxpayer-funded PCA program, and it's been a problem for years. At $600 million a year, PCA funds make up just 7% of Minnesota's Medicaid budget, but constitute 43% of Medicaid fraud investigations. Joel Walter works in the Minnesota office of the legislative auditor. Found uh, some pretty significant problems in the program at that time. He authored a report in 2009 that found the PCA program was unacceptably vulnerable to fraud and abuse and lacks sufficient state oversight and accountability. One of the problems he highlighted, few spot reviews of randomly selected PCA agencies like About You Inc. That's the company that was supposed to supervise Aaron and Betsy. But our investigation found, six years later, DHS is just starting those random audits. You said you're initiating the random audits. When do you expect to start that? Um, we're starting at this month. Meanwhile, Andrew and the other Davies kids are left to wonder, why didn't Child Protection intervene when they were warned? Why didn't the Davies PCA agency notice problems? And how could a public health nurse who visited last summer possibly report to DHS that they were living in a neat and clean home. The same home recently found unsafe for human occupancy. Something definitely could have been done earlier. Yeah, Erin Davies, she's not facing any charges, but as you just heard, DHS tells us they have opened an official investigation based on the evidence that we showed them. This week, a CARE 11 News investigation revealed eight children living in filthy conditions in a Richfield home, while county and state agencies either turned a blind eye or ignored repeated warnings. Today, Governor Mark Dayton responded to that investigation, acknowledging that, quote, multiple failures occurred. Here's CARE 11's A.J. Legault. And so I thank uh, CARE 11 for dramatizing this and bringing it to everybody's attention. What has Governor Dayton's attention is a story that went untold for far too long. No kid should have to suffer through that at all. 
It is in large part Andrew Davies' life story, a life lived in a Richfield home with seven other younger adopted kids where conditions were, in the words of the governor after viewing Carol Evans' reports, horrible, awful, and a breakdown in the system. Anytime there's you know one child or one family that's caught in that kind of just uh, horrible situation, it's one too many and means that there are multiple failures. Multiple failures, including Hennepin County Child Protection not taking action despite multiple warnings that the kids living in the home were at risk. And after the second call, and it was still unsubstantiated, I just stopped making calls. I didn't feel like it was going to get anywhere anyway. Failures, including a state-funded personal care assistance agency tasked with ensuring the kids' health and safety needs were being met, never raising a red flag about conditions in the home that has since been ruled dangerous and unfit for human occupancy. It was a hellhole. A hellhole. A hellhole, yeah. Failures, including a Hennepin County public health nurse on a mandated home visit just last summer, describing this house as a neat and clean home. The bathroom up above is coming right down through the ceiling here. You don't want to stand in here. That's all black and old. Failures to ensure the kids were receiving the taxpayer-funded care that Erin Davies and her now deceased mom Betsy, who had fostered and adopted all the children, were being paid for. Were you lying on those timesheets or were you actually working those hours? The fact that they reached the level of just uh, uh, just, you know, awful, awful, awfulness is not a word, awful, but it's bad to get to be as awful as they are. I mean, it just, it just, um, some of these things, you know, just defy my comprehension. Of the way. As you saw the governor there at a loss for words talking about the report. He also noted, as we've previously reported, that the Department of Human Services has launched an investigation in response to what we uncovered. I think it fails Minnesota, frankly. Um, children shouldn't have to live that way. Minnesota Attorney General Lori Swanson today responding to Carol Levin's reports showing the horrific conditions eight adopted children were forced to live in inside this Richfield home. You don't want to stand in here. That's all black and old. After seeing these images, Swanson says Hennepin County needs to be investigating just what was going on in this home. I hope they are and they should be because um, the conditions in which these kids are, are were living uh, based on the video I've seen is absolutely deplorable. Where the attorney general says her office is taking action. We're um, taking it very seriously. And is giving a good hard look at Medicaid funds paid out by the Department of Human Services through the Personal Care Assistance or PCA program to Betsy and Aaron Davies for care of the children they adopted. Prosecuting this state video, which all new PCA providers are required to watch, makes clear PCA fraud is no joke. That falsely reporting hours on your timesheet is a felony. Theft of one dollar of public funds is a felony. In this timesheet from late December of last year, Aaron Davies claims to spend 21 hours working with one of her adopted sisters and another 34 hours helping her adopted brother, 20-year-old Andrew Davies, with basic things like dressing, grooming, bathing, and eating. What do you think seeing that? Uh, shocking. Um, it's actually kind of funny because it, it didn't happen. Didn't happen? No. I mean, I could eat myself. I'm a... I can dress myself. Um, yeah, I did a lot on my own. Payroll records obtained by Kara Levin show Aaron through her employer, About You Inc., billed taxpayers for 108 hours of care for Andrew last June alone, including 12 hours on June 24th. The same day, former friends say Aaron took an evening flight to Vegas with them. Any idea what was being done for all, all the PCA money that she was being paid? <sighs> I have no idea, man. I couldn't tell you. We wanted Aaron Davies to tell us. Excuse me, Miss Davies. I'm Carol Levin. We want to ask you some questions about the PCA hours you claim you were working. While she refused to talk with us, she is speaking out on Facebook. One of her friends shared this message Aaron posted after meeting with Attorney General investigators on Friday. She writes, she's confident the truth will come out. While Swanson won't discuss specifics of their investigation, she says they're reviewing all the facts. We're going to move it forward as quickly as we can, and we'll take uh, whatever action uh, is appropriate after it concludes.
11 felony counts of theft by false representation. That's what this criminal complaint filed today charges Aaron Davies with. In essence, ripping off taxpayers by falsely claiming to provide personal care assistance to special needs children. Down through the ceiling here. Trash filled rooms. You don't want to stand here. That's all black and old. Bare mattresses stained with animal feces and urine. The images from inside the Richfield home where eight special needs children lived <sighs> have left a bad taste in the mouth of all who see them. And I think it fails Minnesota, frankly. Including uh, Minnesota Attorney General Lori Swanson. I've seen your video and these children were living in just abject squalor conditions. But Carol Evans' investigation found not just children living in squalor, but also their caregivers. 34-year-old Aaron Davies and her now deceased mom Betsy billing taxpayers for Medicaid funded personal care assistance or PCA services for Andrew Davies and two other adopted kids that didn't appear to have been provided as claimed. Didn't happen? No. Any idea what was being done for all, all the PCA money that she was being paid? I have no idea, man. I couldn't tell you. After our stories aired, the attorney general vowed to investigate. That type of conduct would be fraud upon the taxpayer. Today, this 11 count complaint was filed, charging Davies with defrauding taxpayers of more than $26,000 since 2009. It details Davies billing for PCA hours when the kids were in school. She claimed to be helping Andrew at the same time he was actually at work. Carol Evans investigation found state billing records showing on September 1st of last year, Aaron claimed to provide Andrew with 15 hours of PCA care when Facebook posts showed she was playing the ponies with friends at Canterbury Park. We exposed how last summer, while in Vegas, Aaron billed the state claiming to provide PCA care for kids who were back in Minnesota. The AG's office corroborated Carol Levin's findings that Aaron billed for PCA services that could not have been provided. On top of the Vegas trip, the criminal complaint shows she claimed to be helping the kids at the exact same time Facebook shows Nights Out at Toby Keith's Bar, the Garth Brooks Concert, and Cowboy Jack's Bar. The list of partying on the taxpayer dime while the kids she was claiming to be caring for lived in filth goes on and on and on. I wanted to ask you about the 11 count complaint. We called Aaron today to discuss the charges. Chung up. She's refused to answer questions about her actions since we first began investigating last January. Were you ripping off taxpayers by lying about the PCA hours you were working? She didn't answer our questions. She'll now have to answer questions before a judge. If convicted on all counts, Aaron Davies faces a maximum sentence of 10 years in prison and tens of thousands of dollars in fines. These images show how eight adopted children lived for years. No child in Minnesota should live in those kind of conditions. Images that have sparked outcry from Minnesota's most powerful. Multiple failures have occurred. Failures include a public health nurse writing the kids lived in a neat and clean home. DHS paying out tens of thousands of taxpayer dollars for care that does not appear to have been provided as claimed. But perhaps the most glaring failure is all the missed warnings by Hennepin Child Protection. Something definitely could have been done earlier. Andrew Davies would know he grew up in the home and says the problems went beyond a filthy house. Um, I was abused by my sister also. How so? Um, slapped around, uh, got like nails in the back of my like neck, um, even got thrown down the stairs one time. Back in February, Andrew filed this child maltreatment report claiming his adult adopted sister, Aaron Davies, mother to two adopted kids and state paid caregiver for the others, physically abused most of the children, throwing a bucket of hot cleaning water at them, clawing their necks, slapping them across the face, not giving the kids their medications and using them herself. Pretty rough stuff. Yeah, pretty rough stuff. Andrew's report was far from being the first time CPS was warned the kids were at risk. This letter shows that someone else made a report in 2010 alleging a child was maltreated, but CPS determined child protective services are not needed. And before that, there were others. You made reports to child protective services? I have. I have in the past, yes. 
This woman who asked we not show her face is a mandated state reporter, meaning she's required by law to report abuse she sees. She claims to have made several official child maltreatment reports, including once after scraping a long dead cat off the floor of a child's bedroom. It's dead animals, it's animal feces, human feces, it's, it's so much more than you could ever just think of. She says her warnings were ignored. They're not doing their due diligence? No. Child protection records aren't public, so it's hard to know what happened behind the scenes. But Hennepin County tells us if a report is screened in, meaning open for investigation, it's automatically forwarded to local law enforcement. So we went to Richfield, where the Davies house was located, and asked the police department a simple question. Did child protection ever forward any of those reports to them? The answer was no. That tells us child protection likely screened out all the reports, never bothering to actually investigate if the kids living here were in danger. State data shows Hennepin County, which received 15 and a half thousand child protection reports last year, screened out nearly two thirds of them. Rex Holzimmer is Hennepin's assistant county administrator for human services. Were too many calls being screened out? I think most of us in the child welfare area would say uh, that there were too many cases screened out over time. The county commissioned a recently completed report on their child safety system. It doesn't mention any specific cases, but concluded child neglect is a low priority and reports of abuse and neglect are being screened out on questionable grounds. Holzmer admits their underfunded, understaffed system has in essence been running a triage system. Um, neglect compared to a sexual abuse case or a physical abuse case, especially a, a gross physical abuse case, is going to fall to a to a lower uh, priority. This is a statewide issue. A review of the most recent federal data shows that in 2013, more than 70 percent of child abuse reports were screened out in Minnesota without any protective action. That's the third highest rate in the country. The issue of screened out CPS calls exploded onto the headlines last year following the death of Eric Dean a little Pope County boy killed by his father's fiance, Amanda Peltier. I've probably slapped him a good six to ten times. Despite 15 warnings that he was being severely abused. He had, you know, scratches, like nail marks on his face, on his head, on his abdomen. Child protection did not intervene. The picture of four-year-old Eric Dean will haunt me for a long time. A special governor's task force was created to initiate reform. During a public hearing this spring, one of the cases brought up. This is a picture of where four girls were sleeping. The Davies house. The investigation did not include a visit to the home, even though the case involves reports of unsafe conditions in the physical home. Just one case out of countless where repeated warnings fell on the deaf ears of child protection screeners. Everybody dropped the ball on these kids. And that's just tragic. Next week, the Hennepin County Board plans to vote on adding nearly 100 new child protection workers and, as we mentioned, a series of new child protection laws that came out of the governor's task force go into effect tomorrow. That includes requiring child protection to share all abuse reports with police, not just the ones they screen in. Carol Evans, AJ Lego is here tonight with an update. AJ. Now, Camille, earlier this year, we revealed how the children were left to live in filth while taxpayers footed the bill, paying a Hennepin County woman tens of thousands of dollars for care that could not have been provided as claimed. After our report aired, the Minnesota Attorney General stepped in, filing felony fraud charges, charges that have now led to a guilty plea. Do you have any comment about these charges saying that you were in casinos and bars and racetracks while still billing taxpayers? After seeing Carol Evans' report, Minnesota's Attorney General vowed to investigate. That type of conduct would be fraud upon the taxpayer. Aaron Davies just pled guilty in court to defrauding taxpayers of more than $63,000, faking her PCA timesheets since 2009. Her sentence, 150 days in the county workhouse. She was also ordered to pay restitution for the $63,000 she stole, but only at a rate of $50 each month. That means the 34-year-old will only pay back taxpayers if she lives to be 139 years old. But as our investigation exposed, taxpayers are not the only victims. This case is about much more than Medicaid fraud. 
the real victims, the foster children in her care, forced to live in a home so filthy and dangerous, it had to be condemned.